Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Library Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. Um, the show is broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it will be available to you later to watch at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our show recordings. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share uh, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on Encompass Live. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. So similar to your state library, um, we just have a different name. Uh, so we provide training and um, databases and grants and resources and support to all types of libraries in the state. Uh, so we have shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries, public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, historical societies. Really our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. Um, something cool libraries are doing, uh, something we think they could be doing. We do book reviews, interviews, um, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Uh, sometimes we have Nebraska Library Commission staff come on and do um, shows for us on uh, resources and services and things we're doing here through the commission. But we also bring in guest speakers and that is what we have with us today. Uh, joining us this morning is Stephen Hall. Good morning, Stephen. Hey. Morning. And he is from um, the East Coast, where I'm originally from, from, the University of Pennsylvania Libraries. I'm not from Pennsylvania, from New York, but. <laughs> um, and this is a session, I think you did this, Computers and Libraries this year? Is that where That's it was right, from? Yeah. yeah, previously, yeah. yes, Computers and Libraries, yeah. About board games, um, um, using board games to uh, teach computer science. Um, we've had sessions on the show before about board games in the library, but never something I'm um, using for this way. So I am, um, I, I did not see his presentation at the conference, but I saw the description of it. So I was very interested to see what this is all about and how you're doing it. Um, so uh, I'll just hand it over to you, Stephen, to take it away and tell us all about how we can do this. Sure, thanks, Krista. Um... And hello everyone. Um, as Krista said, my name is Stephen Hall. Um, I'm the librarian for computer science and engineering at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. In the attendee list, I saw we had someone from the Philadelphia Free Library. So uh, hello, I'm waving to you from my office window. Um, <laughs> and I think I saw we had someone from Sierra Vista, Arizona. I spent 15 years living in Tucson, been to Sierra Vista many times. So shout out to the Southwest as well. Um, but uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here to talk a little bit about yeah, how we can use board games as a teaching tool for computer science. So um, a little bit about me and kind of how I'm connected to this. Um, so I, I have a very sort of broad background. Um, my, I was a board game enthusiast long before I was a computer science folk. Uh, um, and I, I have been a gamer for about 20 years, um, played well over a thousand board games in my life, um, like a thousand different games. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've been, uh, spent time in working in museums, archives, uh, now of course in library. Um, and I also uh, got a, an additional degree in computer science, um, sort of because that's my idea of a good time. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, I, what I what I realized was that as I was studying computer science, I if you've ever if you yourself have ever tried to learn how to write programs, how to learn learn to code or whatnot, it can feel very arcane, very confusing, sort of abstract. And uh, you know, and I was experiencing the same thing like most of us do when we're first learning. Um, but there was one time where I had a, a light bulb moment where I realized that all the computer was doing is game things, it's doing board game stuff. And when I had that realization, my entire perspective on both games and computers fundamentally changed and has never gone away. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I'm happy to do here is be able to share this with you and sort of talk about how, how these things are connected and how we can use them as librarians. So with that in mind, I'll start with, um, there's two things that are happening right now simultaneously. 
The first is technical literacy is becoming a, a big part of the overall picture of information literacy. As librarians, we like to talk about information literacy, and when we say that, what we usually mean is like how to uh, find information, how to evaluate and assess the quality of information, how to use a library, things like that. But more and more as time goes on, um, technical aspects of this are becoming more important as well. Uh, you know, it's it's no secret that you know coding is is more important than ever, uh, and understanding how like large language models work. As, as AI is creeping into everything, just, just the technical piece is becoming more and more important. Um, and at the same time, the other thing that's happening in a completely different area is we're in what's being called a golden age of board games. Um, mm -hmm. Some of you probably know this, um, if you yourselves are gamers, um, some perhaps not, but if you didn't know this, board games have grown up a lot since we were kids. Um, board games are better than ever before by leaps and bounds they're coming out in an unprecedented rate and they are totally unlike what you remember if you were playing games like in the 80s 90s um it's not just monopoly and scrabble and the game of life anymore um mm -hmm. they're they're totally different and totally better and so as sort of a like a 2.1 point here um as this golden age is 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 steadily growing libraries are often collecting games as loanable materials they're they're becoming part of part of a library's collection uh, being used for like community game nights or sometimes to be loaned to patrons to go and play in return just like they would with a book so these two things are happening simultaneously and they seem entirely unrelated but they're really not and i'll and i'll i'll, I'll speak to that today so board games provide an amazing framework for teaching computer science and particularly as libraries are collecting them and adding them to their to their to their stores, um, we are uniquely well positioned to use games to t as educational tools for teaching technical literacy and computer science. So, for starters, just a little you know very brief touch on history here. Board games and computers have been connected since the absolute beginning of computer science. We're talking about like the you know 1940s and 50s, like Alan Turing's era. Um, board games have been connected. I mean, this is a, an example from UPenn's library archives here. Um, it's an old pamphlet from the Atomic Energy Commission, which shows one of these large mainframe computers playing chess with a human. Um, I mean, this is really a, a pretty good metaphor for this. But I mean, since again, since the earliest days of, of electronic computers, we've seen games like chess checkers go backgammon have been well studied um and uh, and continue to do so today um so i want to take a moment here because i don't want to assume that everyone in in who's listening is a programmer themselves some of you may be and if so then uh feel free to go get a cup of coffee and come back in like eight minutes and we'll we'll, we'll be <laughs> we'll move on for those of you who, who perhaps have not done any, any coding work or, or are not familiar with computer science, I'm just gonna give a very, very, very brief overview of some of the things that computers do under the surface. So computers have, they, they operate on math and logic. That's all they are is logic machines. And some of the things that they do, they, they use Booleans, conditionals, loops, comparison operators, variables, uh, specifically I'll be talking about counting variables, and pseudo random number generation. So I would say that any program you've ever used uh, on a computer, whether it's like a game, a, a software tool, anything like it, these are the kinds of things that are going on under the hood. And we'll look at some of like sort of what these actually are, again, very briefly here, just to give an introduction for, the, for, for folks who are not in this space. So Booleans are uh, just true-false statements. I mean, as librarians, we know about Boolean, Booleans and searching. Yes. So, and that's that's how they work in programming too, just true or false. So like, it is raining outside, either yes or no, one or zero, true or false, on or off, it is or it is not. In terms of code, it might look something like this. I mean, we have uh, you know a variable that is true, a variable that is false, um, either or, one or zero, binary. Um, there's also conditionals. So conditionals are what you can think of as if then else type statements. So you might say like, if you're making oatmeal cookies, add raisins. Otherwise 
you'd add chocolate chips. So it's like if A, do B. Otherwise, if C, do D. Um, and it's it's an it's a it's a way that a computer can make a decision. Um, and again, in, in terms of, of code, it might look like this. You know, if someone has an if if nut allergy is is true, then don't add nuts to the cookies. Otherwise, do add nuts to the cookies. Um, something like that. It's an if then if, if then else statement. Um, computers also use what are called loops, and there's different kinds of loops, but you can think of them as iterating statements. They continue operating until some condition is met. Um, so you might you might say like for every dozen cookies that you want to make, you're going to add another set of ingredients. You know, another cup of flour, another two eggs, another. For every dozen, you're going to you're going to add to that recipe. Um, or you might say you might do what's called a while loop. So you have a for loop and a while loop. So a while loop says you know while the batter is not thoroughly mixed, keep mixing it. So you're going to continue doing this operation until the condition is met until the batter is mixed. So loops just sort of continue continue going for a, a, a sometimes a specified, sometimes an unspecified amount of time. Again, in code terms, it might look like this: if, I, if I'm making three dozen cookies, you know, for each of those dozens, I'm going to add ingredients. Um, this is obviously pseudo code. If you put this on your computer, it wouldn't run, but this is how it might might look overall. Um, Comparison operators are literally just math. I mean, just math comparisons. You know, we have Rory ate five cookies, Oliver ate three cookies. And so you can ask a computer to compare these variables and it will respond with Boolean values, true or false. Um, and again, I'll, you know, I'll mention here that any program you use on a computer, this is the stuff that it's doing. You don't see this most of the time, but this is what makes programs run. This is what makes computers operate. Um, a big thing in computer science is variables. And specifically, again, I'll be talking about incrementing and decrementing variables, but these are basically numbers that go up and down. So let's say that we start continuing with my cookie example. We have no cookies, but then I make a dozen so that that number goes up. You eat some, the number goes down, I make some more, you eat some more, and the number, you can see this number can fluctuate. It's a, it's a single value, but it'll change over time. Um, so it might, you know, in code terms, it might be like this. Um, you know, I have a value X, which is one, and I add three to it and it becomes four. And then I subtract two and it's down to two. So it's the same kind of thing, the number just goes up and down. And then pseudo random number generation, obviously you just pick a number. Um, you know, if, if it's cookies, you know, you have a jar of a bunch of different kinds of cookies and take one or like draw a marble from a bag of marbles or um, stuff like that. Just a, a, a pseudo random, a semi random result from a, from a set of options. Um, and so, you know, in code, if I if I was doing it like this, you know, I, I, I can pick a number, you know, in the, the one to 10, one to 100, one to 1000 range. You know, and each time I run this, it would likely give me different results, but it's it's just picking a number. Um, and so <laughs> I'm sure that you all love math, and uh, I'm sure that you all want to be talking about math at 10 a.m. or whatever your time is. Um, but I, not being a math guy myself, this is not really my strong suit, but there is sort of an important point here about two different kinds of math. Um, we have, you know, if you think about the math that you learn in school, you have different categories of it. You have, you know, geometry, which is different from trigonometry, which is different from algebra. Those are all kind of their own group of math. A another way to classify math is you can think about continuous versus discrete mathematics. So continuous math, you can think of it as, it's built on the idea that between any two numbers, there's an infinite number of other numbers, right? Between zero and one, there's an infinite number of decimal values. It's librarians, this is what makes the Dewey Decimal System work. It's, it's infinitely expandable. Um, so that's contrasted then with discrete math, which is, you can think of it as it's math that's built on finite sets, on like fixed sets where values are known and you can count them in, in a group. Um, and so uh, to give an example, continuous math, you can think of it as, as, as it's measured 
versus counted for discrete math. So you can buy 1.35 pounds of apples, but you can't buy 1.35 cars. It's a measured versus a counted value. And the reason that this matters is because board games are discrete mm -hmm. in nature. They're inherently discrete. Um, so if you consider a, 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 you know, a game like chess or Ticket to Ride or Go, or really any game you can think of, what you're doing is you survey a board that has a number of options and you pick an option. But the number of options that you have to choose from is not infinite, right? In Ticket to Ride here, you're trying to connect different cities. You're trying to place these train routes to connect cities. And between any two cities, there's usually a lot of different ways you can get from point A to point B, but it's not infinite, right? Like, and, and on, you know, on a Go board, mm -hmm. you have a fixed number of options that typically tends to dwindle. And so, you know, you, you have on a fresh Go board, you have 19 squared, 461 or whatever that is, 361 options, um, but never more than that. So in theory, if you were bored enough, you could go through and actually count how many choices you have. It's a discrete value. It's not an infinite number. Um, Santorini, another another you know great game here. You know, like on a given turn, you know, you might have like 12, 13 options or something, but you could go through and count how many choices you have. Orchard, another. This is a solitaire game I enjoy. Same kind of thing. It's it, you have a small decision space, and you each turn you 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 pick whatever option you think is the best. And so board games are built on the same exact principles as computer science. And it's not even that I, I'm sort of reaching here for a parallel. It's not like they're, they're sort of related. No, these are, it's the same. It's the same exact principles. And even if this is, here's, the, here's one of the key points here is, even if you've never programmed at all, you don't know anything about programming at all, You've interacted with programming concepts when playing a game. Because I'd imagine, sure, some of you probably have never written code, but you've surely all played a board game before. Whether you enjoyed it or not is beside the point. <laughs> but you've seen you've seen these these principles at play. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm gonna pause here just to see if we have any questions at this point. Mm, yeah, let's see. Um, sure. Does anybody have any questions or comments uh, about any of this? Uh, um i i did a itty bitty bit of programming computer programming like i took a class when i was in high school i think it was yeah. a fun class <laughs> um but really nothing since then but i i remember the concepts and i see what you're saying here the board games and um definitely uh me myself and my husband are friends are big board gamers too we do actually do a gaming thing every weekend with mm -hmm. tabletop games of some sort with friends so it's it's a regular thing so i'm seeing the connection here definitely i know you but you never thought about it before it's just yes i've got to make I yeah well, I'll, you know we'll, we'll expound upon here and dig a little deeper i mean it's it, the connections are they run deep here um mm -hmm. um let's see we do have a couple of things that have popped up here uh um oh when you're talking about the beginning about the um the, the, the picture of the chess and the computer being taught chess yeah. um uh, someone said didn't college students create whole games on mainframe computers that's right so back yeah. in back in like the 70s um groups of what i'll call nerds from places like johns hopkins and and like bell laboratories would create chess playing computers and usually it was at, at gatherings like the Association of Computing Machinery's annual gathering. They would have their their machines play each other for like nerd dominance. <laughs> nice. Proud nerds, yes. <laughs> Be proud. Um, and someone wants to know, because this I know this is which is specifically talking about board games, but someone wants to know, do you do research um relating um program to anything else? Um like uh let's see here i'm trying to get the screen back up here um do you do research relations between uh, ttrpgs and programming uh, tabletop i mean sure games? sure so yeah stuff like D D or call of cthulhu right. um i i'm looking at this as kind of all encompassing for tabletop anything um, 
again, if you if you look at history, so what D and D grew out of, some people may know this, mm -hmm. uh, others may not, but you know, D and D grew out of of old war games, and mm -hmm. out of D and D grew early text adventure computer games, um, and like so the the histories of traditional games on a physical board versus like miniature pencil and paper RPGs like D&D &D, and even mm -hmm. video games, they're all intertwined. Um, so really th this, these, these ideas, these concepts, they apply to any and all of them. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a, a traditional board gamer than an RPG player, but I mean, I've, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've been around the block with D&D &D and such before too. And, and it, you can easily apply these to those, those as well. Yeah, I've done both. We've done the the, the pen and paper and board yep. games and video games, which is a whole. No matter thing. how many hours do you want to spend on a combat scenario? <laughs> but, um, and if you get that joke, then yeah, you're nerdy too. Um, <laughs> so, so one one way I can think about it is when playing a game, your job as a player is to examine a number of options before you, and that's a finite number. It's a it's a it's a a discrete number. And pick the best one. And you can almost think of a board game as, at least at least when it's a competitive game, like like chess is a, you know a classic example. You can think of chess as it's almost like I two players are challenging each other with puzzles, where each turn I give you my opponent a puzzle, and you try to solve that puzzle well, and then you in turn give me a puzzle which I try to solve, and we're going to give each other these. We're going to pass this puzzle back and forth. And in general, the player who wins is the player who better solves the puzzle. That's kind of a, a different way to think about a game. Um, but but we'll look at these side by side. So I've I've you know I've talked about these different CS principles, and I've I've said vaguely that they they have equivalents in board games. But I actually want to literally compare them next to each other. And so we can think about okay, random number generation. That one's pretty obvious. Where does that appear in a board game? Well. I mean, it, it's obvious, it's like rolling a die, right? Or drawing a card, spinning a spinner, um, pulling something out of a bag. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this is like, this is this is the most obvious one for sure. Um, so variables and counting variables. Again, these are the numbers that go up and down, that, that increment or decrement. This, there's a number of ways these appear as well. Um, speaking of D&D, &D, this could be things like a, a player's level. Or a player's uh, like a player's hit points. They go, you know, you, you, you know, you might be in a combat encounter where your hit points go down, and then and then your your cleric heals you, and you you go back up. Or like in Ticket to Ride, you know, you have your you have your your scoring as you play. Your score might go up if you don't complete a route. You might lose points. You might go back down. Um, there's tons and tons of places where variables and counting variables appear in games. But really, any kind of like numerical value, you can pretty much think of as as a, a variable. Um, so conditionals, then these like if then else type statements, these appear um, usually. They would be like something like a combat encounter, like you know, if you're fighting a monster in you know in D and D or betrayal at House on the Hill or whatever, you know, you, you if you roll x mm -hmm. amount of, of if you roll x number or higher your attack hits otherwise it misses and so it's like you know if i you know if i roll an, an you know a 16 or higher i i slay the dragon otherwise it's an if then if a do b otherwise if c do d um same kind of thing um we see loops the one the ones that are either like that do something either for each item in a set or do something for an for a uh you know an, a definite or indefinite period of time. Um, in game design, there's often something called a game loop, which the example that I'll give here would be from the game of Catan or Settlers of Catan, as, as depending on how you know it, which would, you know, and in that game, the game loop says, you know, the goal of that game, if you didn't know, is you want to get to 10 points. The first person at 10 points wins. So in that game, you can say, you can sort of flip that on its head and say, while no player has reached 10 points, you keep taking turns, right? I take a turn and then we check, has anyone reached 10 points? No, okay, your turn. Anyone reached 10 points? No. And it's 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 the, the overall loop of the game. So, I mean, that's one example of where these might appear. Um, 
Booleans, you can see this one uh, is two lines thick, so it's there's a little more in this. Booleans are, this one's a little trickier, the true or false values, but there are a number of ways these appear too. And they usually have to do with just general game states. So for example, again, in, in Catan, you know, if you want to build a city, you have to first have a settlement. So if I want to build a city, there's like this Boolean check of, you know, has settlement is either true or false. If it's false, then you can't build a settlement or you can't build a city. Otherwise, if it's true, you can. Or like in Go, um, you know, either a stone is surrounded or it's not. Um, or like in a worker placement game, like Agricola or Viticulture, it would say like, you know, either a space is available or is not available. And so these are these are a little more abstract sort of in, in where you might see them, but Booleans are all over uh, board games as well. Um, so this is actually, we, I didn't actually talk about this with objects, classes, and instances, because this, this is a little bit, this is like deeper level computer science knowledge. But mm -hmm. uh, and if you, so if you don't know about objects and classes, so it doesn't really matter. But if you do, there's a parallel there as well. You can think of like instances of a player class um, is, you know, player A, player B, where each player has certain uh, certain traits like, you know, a, a, a score, a, a hit point, um, you know, what's in their hand, et cetera. Um, and to to make these, to draw out these par these comparisons to even more kind of broad look, you can think about in, in computer science, you know, the program code is what makes a, a program run. Like the code is what the computer reads to know what you want it to do. And the board game equivalent is literally the rule book, right? It's like the rule book is this, this framework of how something is supposed to work. It's like the skeleton of how this program or game is supposed to work. It's the, the rules, the laws that dictate that and how that's supposed to go. And then to take that even one step further, it's like to actually execute a program would be to, of course, play the game, right? You, um, you know, if I write a bunch of code, it's not until I run the program that anything happens. Um, you know, when I run the program, that's when variables are, are, are picked. That's when decisions might be made and it might have an unexpected outcome. When, it's, when it comes to a board game, a set of rules by itself doesn't really matter. But it's when you as players make decisions, you roll dice, you choose what to do, you put meat on the bones of that program code and actually make it into a meaningful experience. So really like from, I mean, at the granular level and even at the zoomed out level, these parallels are, they're exactly the same. It's its not even just a similarity, they're identical. And, at, and I mean, some of you may have already been thinking about one or both of these things. You're talking about chess players, like teams of researchers competing against each other with chess programs. And that does bring up the 96, 97 Deep Blue series, um, if you remember that, where uh, the first sign that humanity was going to be doomed when Deep Blue beat Garry Kasparov. Um, <laughs> and then uh, perhaps maybe less well known, but but some of you may have seen this a couple of years ago, the AlphaGo match against Lee Sedol, the, the Korean uh, world champion of Go, where AlphaGo went four for five against Lee in that game. And, um, you know, we've seen these are, these are, these were used as, as sort of a proof of concept for computer, you know, computers being able to do things like machine learning in the case of AlphaGo, using neural networks to really learn and understand and master the seemingly unmasterable game of Go. Mm. I mean, this is again a long-standing tradition. And so I'll actually, I'll give some examples here of specific instances of games where these appear. So there's a game, I, I, a recent game I like called Ready, Set, Bet, where, you know, in the rule book, these are, these are direct quotes from rule books. You know, so while a race is in progress and before, you know, some condition has been met, you can place your betting tokens. But as soon as the race ends, you have to stop. So it, it's, it's a, it, something continues for a set amount of time and as soon as that stops, then you you know that then that ends. Or you know a for loop here, um, you know for each of the the four resource districts, count how many game pieces a player has, and the player with the most scores points. Um, 
And you can see that they're even using the same language like while and for. I mean, it literally is a while loop and a for loop. Um, you know, or or a, a conditional here. You know, I mentioned um, like a combat check, where if you roll X amount of, of uh, X amount on the dice and you succeed, you know, if you pass a combat check, you defeat the monster. Otherwise, if you fail, then the monster deals combat damage. Um, a comparison statement: uh, Betrayal at House on the Hill is a game I've loved for many years. Um, oh yeah, it's one of our favorites. <laughs> and if, 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 if two players are fighting, it's you know I roll dice and you roll dice. And whoever rolls a higher number wins the encounter. So you have these two variable values, the die roll, or these two um, unpredictable values that when they're rolled, then you compare, you know, is A higher than B or is B higher than A? Um, it's literally just a simple mathematical comparison. Um, you know, incrementing variables, again, there's tons of examples of these, like score tracks and stuff. Um, you know, just one example is from the game Scythe, where you can, you know, move up and down on them power track or you know but other, other you know other examples again hit points score tracks um stuff like that um a bo you know boolean statement is not another game i love there's a game called nexus ops that I've, I've also loved for many years um you know it and you can see again they're, they're actually using literally the words the word true you know a player is eliminated if both the following conditions are true and this is actually both kind of a boolean and a conditional it's 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 an if statement that also is using booleans as well. So these these appear, I mean, anywhere you look, you can see these. And 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 you, I would I would I would be willing to bet money that you could not, you cannot think of a game in existence that doesn't use at least I'd say, like two of these principles. I mean, we could think about like the simplest game you can think of would be like, you know, we'll take turns flipping a coin and the first player to flip heads wins. Not a good game, but a simple <laughs> game. In, in, in a game like that, you know, we have, we have essentially it's a random number generator, you know, one or zero heads or tails. And so we have, we have, we have um, random number generation and we also have a conditional or we, we have like a, 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 a conditional, like, you know, um, you know, if you roll heads, you win, or if you flip heads, you win. If you flip tails, the game continues. Um, you know, so even in like you know the, the simplest kind of game, it still uses all these. So something else that I like to do, this is a little bit of a, a sidebar here, is being in computer science. I really like, I like to use, uh, I like to use games, particularly children's games, because they're simpler to do data analysis and. Um, so there's there's a game called First Orchard, which is a game that it literally is for ages two and up. So it's barely even a game, but uh, you know I wrote I wrote a program that plays the game because I was curious at how you know it's a cooperative game and how long does a game usually take? Hmm. What are the you know how often do you, would players attempt to win or lose if they make all of the optimal decisions? And so I wrote this code and. I made my computer play, you know, 100,000 rounds of the game and, and, and generated the results here in this beautiful bell curve. And uh, so this, you know, if you're interested in like data exploration, there's a wealth of, of, uh, of knowledge here to, to be extracted. Likewise, there's a game called Dinosaur Tea Party, which is, um, it's, like a, it's like a better version of Guess Who. And I was trying to figure out, you know, again, how long, uh, you know, how how long can we expect, how many questions can we expect that it would take for the for the computer to get the right answer? And you know, I did all this data analysis. And as a sidebar to a sidebar, um, because I play these with my five-year-old, having done this data analysis, make sure that I can crush her every time we play. <laughs> she doesn't stand a chance because I have. To, the 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 heavy computation behind it. Um, uh, I'm sure so, she'll beat you anyway sometimes. No, yeah, she sometimes <laughs> does win anyway by 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 because I because I let her win. But another thing I want to do, and this is sort of as far as where where do we go with this? So there there's there's this there's these connections here, and as librarians and some of whom may be collecting games, um, here's this is another way that we can use them. We can use them as a teaching tool, uh, showing how these, you know, where these parallels live. If you yourself are in programming, maybe you're teaching a class in like introductory Python. 
Um, again, it can feel very abstract for someone to learn this for the first time, but if you put it in board game terms, it makes things feel immediately more approachable and more understandable. Instead of, instead of thinking about it as, my computer is generating a random seed value, and then from there it's extracting a number. It's like, no, it's rolling a die when it's doing a random number generation. It's, literally, it's just rolling a die. And if you think about it like that, it makes sense in a different way. And so what I've done here, and I'll, I'll hold on this slide so that you can, you know, you can take pictures of it or whatnot, is these are specific games that I love. Um, I can personally attest to the quality of each and every one of these games um, as, you know, for different, for teaching different STEM principles. And they're not even all computer science. I mean, you can see I have like engineering and even biology and stuff on here. So whatever it is that you are wanting to teach, you know, or you're wanting to, if someone is interested in probability theory, I mean, can't stop is a gold, is a golden classic for that. Um, you know, or teaching deduction, like deductive reasoning, sleuth and Turing machine are great. So, so these are, you know, this is for someone perhaps who is, you know, if you're a librarian who's saying, yeah, this sounds cool. And I've heard about other libraries putting games in their collection and I kind of want to do that, but I don't know which games. Well, here's, here's your shopping list here. Um, you know, I, each and every one of these are, are games that I really love and would play in a heartbeat. Um, it's a good way if you're trying to convince your whoever is in, in your administration in charge of your purchasing or questioning why are you doing this, not just for fun, it's also for educational purposes, it can be. Right, you can say that some nerd at UPenn said I should get these. <laughs> um, and so, but but I mean, each and every one of these, again, mm -hmm. I've played every one of them, and every one of these is, they're not only fun games, they're good games, but they also, they also can be easily used as instructional tools for, mm -hmm. and, and they go hand in hand with, with computer science education, or in some cases, yeah, like, you know, learning about biology, learning about engineering principles. Um, and I, I want to, I want to leave, uh, I want to just sort of say, you know, where else do we see these? I mean, can you think of other examples where we see these gaming principles appear? Mm -hmm. and, and also just kind of open up the floor to questions and, and discussion. Sure, sure. And I will mention, because you were talking about that previous slide, for people to get a good long look at it. We will yep. have the slides will be available to you all afterwards with the recording. Yep. They just a reminder, anyone who came in late and didn't um, hear about that at the beginning, yes. Um, this whole session is being recorded and um, the slides will be a separate document that you'll be able to go through um, afterwards as well. So just make sure you all are aware of that. So you don't have to try and scribble all this down if you don't want to, <laughs> we'll have this to you afterwards. And looking at my slide here, I'm already realizing that I've forgotten, like I should have added <laughs> this one, this one, this one, yeah. So. <laughs> there is some, if, if this is said. not enough recommendations, uh, <laughs> please let me know and I will happily give you more. <laughs> Yeah, as you said in the beginning, golden age of board gaming, it is definitely, it is it is crazy how many are, are coming out lately. Yeah. Um, we have sh at my house too many, so many shells of big games and games and that we haven't played yet. <laughs> yeah. And uh, new ones that we see and Kickstarters that we see that we yeah. want to get and it's just an ongoing uh, obsession yeah. like i said this this golden age I mean, really if you look back far enough it, it it can really kind of begin in the late 90s um mm -hmm. but it since the late 90s it's kind of done a you know steady increase and then all of a sudden around like 2010 or 2012 it just rocketed up in popularity and it's never stopped became much more mainstream yeah not just yeah. the nerds like us who played dnd &D yeah scene. i mean i remember when it was still a kind of a quirky underground hobby but it's <laughs> it's not like that anymore which is great i mean more more and more people are being exposed to this and it's a great hobby to be in and there's just so many types of games too so if you're not sure you know i don't know board board games which one should i do well this can give you an idea what are you interested in what kind of things do you like to do or read about or um are you interested are you are you a big in engineering are you 
do you like biology? Do you like reading about, you know, birds or dinosaurs or um, dragons or whatever? You know, is there something that you know that you like? This can get you into the types of games that you could use, you, you might enjoy. Yeah. Um, or if you've got people coming into your library and wondering, well, which game would you recommend? Well, let me ask. It's, you know, you got to do the same kind of thing, reader's advisory. And this right. can give you that same kind of um, help with uh, recommending a game to someone. Right. Know? Also, I mean, I'll, I'll also recommend, um, you know, if, 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 if you just in your personal life, if you're, you know, if you're a parent, um, I got two little kids and I'm always playing games with them. So you know if you're looking for recommendations for kids again dinosaur tea party is a really good one also i have this game listed robot turtles is a really good one for little kids um and and there's plenty plenty more as well for young children okay. even as young as two. Oh yeah even the littlest kids can get into this yeah um so we have a question, you know, do you uh, have you actually used done this in in your library like taught done any sort of program or actual classes that are here we're going to learn how to do programming using this board game and how have you had have you have you actually um so yes and no i so <laughs> i i teach i teach classes all the time that use board games mm -hmm. um but typically i'm actually i don't i don't do too much teaching of how to code but that's simply because here at upenn the students are often are they already know how to do it very often mm. um, so you know even even in non-stem disciplines even you know folks in humanities and stuff often have had some exposure to programming so it, it's it's just that's not really as much of a need here at penn i would say but but you know, in other libraries where that is maybe not as given of as much of an, a given. Um, it depends on who your um, a, the audience is, who's who's using your library. Yeah, yeah. Who, you know, who is your community? I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. at an Ivy League university, there's a lot of people that already know how to do this kind of stuff. But, mm -hmm. but again, you know, a, a different community that there might be a, a, a bigger need for that. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, as far as the connections between board games and, and computer science, that is like a key research field of mine yeah um i you know i i'm interested in in the history of board games as a, as a, a historian as well mm, uh, oh, yeah. but also just kind of how we've seen these connections to computer science again dating back to early mainframe computers and even before that yeah um someone says they can see using this in their um k-12 school library um sure and or in the school itself just working you know if the library is collecting the board games or is um you know working with the the classes like here's something beyond just basic library work if you're teaching a computer like i said i took a way back when computer science class um, programming class when i wasn't in, in was it high school or elementary school i don't know um it was pre-college <laughs> so uh, so there are classes being and especially now like the, learning programming is a big thing that kids and we're doing a lot younger um yeah we we loan out here from in nebraska from the nebraska library commission we loan out tech kits that are mm -hmm. um robots or um you know makey makey and little bits yep. things that teach kids programming to libraries to use in their in their um uh programs that they might do at the library um and this is definitely something that i don't know if we'll ever invest in board games to do that that might be beyond what we do but telling libraries you can also use your board games to do the same thing yeah so i mean you know and it, obviously having a, having games in your collection i mean it, it, it's 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 a even if you're not using them for computer science purposes it's a good hook for mm -hmm. people i mean especially as we're in this golden age and people are taking notice who might not have been gamers for a long time, people mm -hmm. are saying like, wow, there's all these games at Target that I don't know about, but I had someone oh, yeah. tell me about Ticket to Ride. And like, just simply the act of having them in on your shelf is another reason that someone might wanna come through your door. Maybe they're not an avid reader, but they wanna play Wingspan because they heard about it on NPR. Mm -hmm. and like, it's, it's, a, it's a good hook. Um, and in terms of like K-12 education, I know that many, many K-12 schools have like after school board game clubs. 
Oh yeah. And so there's kind of a natural synergy there as well. I mean, that's, you know, especially, you know, if there's a, if there's some teacher who's, who's geeky about this kind of stuff, who, who runs that, I mean, there, there's, you know, the library, you know, is a great place to host that. Um, it's, and there it's are so many games out there. It can be, I think, definitely overwhelming to decide what to buy and being able to go to the library and they will have it for you. You don't have to buy every single one of these games right. like I do at you my house. Try it, you, <laughs> you can try it before you buy it. You know, exactly. it's, it's also for folks who are gamers. It's also nice because, you know, games are not cheap. I mean, the, no. some of the ones that I are on, I mean, some of the ones on this slide are, you know, some of these are $20, but some of them are like, 80 bucks or something yeah. and so like it's not you know sometimes people want to be you know a little bit more discerning about what they what they want to buy mm -hmm. and so there's also the sense of like oh the library has this game that i've been interested in i haven't pulled the trigger yet but i can try it there Testing and then that can help me determine if i actually want to buy it or not absolutely so, i mean it's, it's 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 as much a community service as mm -hmm. a teaching tool that can easily be applied to computer science Definitely. Um, and if and uh, we do, if anyone's looking for more information about um, that part of it, like having board games at your library or running a board game club or something, we've done previous shows on that on Encompass Live. So, <laughs> um, and I can show you um, some of those shows that we've um, had before too. And. Uh... Chris, I mean, I'll also offer that I'm, you know, if if you are interested in, like, if you want more personal recommendations, whether it's for your library or just like, I'm looking for games for my five year old, I'm more than happy to to give you as more more uh, suggestions than you'll ever want. Um, and That's Krista, I, Krista can probably share out my my email address. Yeah, yeah, we'll include that. Um with uh, some of the uh, recording information yeah sure. um but yes please please feel free to to reach out to me for suggestions or uh, other ideas or whatnot yeah absolutely so does anybody else have any other questions or comments we still got about 10 minutes left in the hours so we got plenty of time people have anything they want to ask about um share about have you used games in your library do you have a board game collection um, that you're wondering what to do with. <laughs> um, if you have any thoughts on that, uh, definitely type into the question section. Um, while um, I'm keeping an eye on that, I want to show you here. Um, this is today's session. If you go, if you use your search engine of choice and type in Encompass Live, you'll come up. Nothing else is called that on the internet so far. Um, lucky for us. <laughs> so um, you'll find our show page and our archive page. These are our up upcoming shows. But I was going to show you where our archives are. This is where all our recorded shows are. Today's show will be at the top of the list. Um, there'll be a link to the recording on our YouTube channel and a link to um, Stephen's slides as well. Um, everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when the recording's ready. It should be by the end of the day tomorrow, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me. Um, and I'll send you the, and we'll also push out on our social media. We have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. See here we promoted about logging in for today's show. And um, here's when we post that the recording of the previous one is available. We also um, post out to our, uh, we have Twitter and then Instagram at the Library Commission. Um, and we use a little abbreviated hashtag Encomp Live for our Encompass Live show. Um, but I'll show you here too, because I did do a quick search. Um, you just get stuff out of my way. So you can search our show archives too to see if we've done a, a show on any particular topic. Um, I tried typing in board games and our search here is very um, simple. I kept bringing up things about library boards. <laughs> so I was like, let's just do games. And that was much better. So you gotta, you know, you're being a librarian to do this, you experiment. So um, here we go. We just did one last year, tabletop gaming in the library, uh, starting a board game club at a small library running a game jam, uh, using board games at the library. So we have done um, lots of sessions over the years about um, board games and gaming um, in libraries. And it, here's running a code club, whole different kind of thing, but um, at libraries. So uh, go ahead and watch some of our older shows if you wanna know about how to do, you bring board games into your library, they're all out there for you. 
And there's a one of the one of the libraries um, here in in the Philly metro area. Um, they're doing the the director of the library is a big gamer himself, and so um, so he's kind of already predisposed to this. But something that he's been doing that that's been a good draw, in addition to just the regular community game nights, mm -hmm. is uh, he's been doing a periodic like game. Um, not like an auction but kind of like a, a buy sell trade event oh nice okay. um, for you know for people who have shelves full of games and they're like oh, i'm not gonna have time to play this it's a good way for them to kind of like move some of them you know and it, and it can be also mm -hmm. sort of a you know a fundraiser if, if you, you charge you know 10 bucks a table or whatever it's you know it can be a little mm -hmm. fundraiser community exposure there's a lot of different angles to take with it nice um yeah that's because there's also i've seen people on different board game groups and stuff that they want to sell or get rid of games if you, know, you say i'm never going to play this one even though i bought it or our group didn't like it but someone else may it's got great reviews but we just didn't like it so now i'd like to pass it on to someone else who will actually possibly enjoy it um probably be a good way to get games at a cheaper um price too that's so cool that a library doing that yeah um, so in our show archives here, you can uh, show you as well, um, you can search just the most recent 12 months if you want to just find something current, but you did see when I did our show, search on gaming, there were shows that were from years ago. Um, so um, don't limit yourself if it's a topic that you think would be okay to be watching an old show about. Um, this is our full show archives going back to when Encompass Live first premiered. And I'm not going to scroll all the way down because if you can see the little scroll bar over here, this is a huge list. Um, it's one giant page, um, but that's why we have the search. Uh, the show first premiered in January 2009. So we're at, what, 16 years now of this. Uh, and we have every single show that we've ever done on here. <laughs> so uh, going back to 2009. So just pay attention to the original broadcast date of anything that you watch, any of our archives. They all have a date so you know when it first happened. Um, many of the shows will be fine to watch, stand the test of time, still be good, useful information, but some things will become old and outdated, resources may have changed drastically, uh, links might be broken, uh, thing, uh, resources or services might not exist anymore, people may work at a different um, library or institution than when they presented for us, so just pay attention to that date there um, if you do watch any of our really old shows. Um, but this is something libraries do keep things for historical purposes, as you're mentioning, Stephen, being a historian. So as long as we have a place to host all of our archives, which right now it is on our uh, the Library Commission's YouTube channel, we will always keep them all out there available to you. And just keep adding as we do more shows. All right, we have a few minutes left. Any left? Bleh. Does anybody have any last minute desperate questions they want to ask us even about board gaming? What? No. Um, about board gaming, uh, computer science, um, anything that you want to ask of him, um, type into the question section and we'll get your questions answered. Um, this is a great session, Stephen. Like I said, I hadn't been able to see your presentation at Computers and Libraries, but um, it definitely jumped out at me being a gamer myself. Um, and anything like that that comes out, I'm always like, oh, I want to know more about that. And being not really a computer programmer <laughs> at all, uh, not a math person really at all, except for, you know, I was an English major. English major went into librarianship and um, mostly use math when I have to play games. Um, we were playing a, uh, just this past weekend the uh, DC deck building game and all the math and that, my head was just spinning, but I did it. <laughs> um, and so yeah, so I'm very happy to have had you on the show and hear about how libraries can use games in a whole new way. Thanks a lot. Thank you for them. Yeah. Well, it doesn't look like anybody's typed anything in while we were chatting. That's okay. Um, like I said, we do have a link here to the university libraries page, but um, we'll also include um, so you can find uh, Stephen through there um, and through the slides that will be available to you um, after. I just sent them over to you. Yeah. All right. So that will wrap it up for today's show. Uh, next week, we will be talking about, um, these are all of our upcoming shows. We've got September booked into October. Um, 
we've got one week we take off. This is enjoy. This is our Nebraska Library Commission Library Association annual um, state conference. We always take that week off for Encompass Live. So if you're a Nebraska library, we will not be. You know, people will all be there that week, so we don't we don't do a show. <laughs> um, so that's one week we will not be having an Encompass Live show, but we've got our other ones booked out here. Uh, next week we'll be talking about memory care initiatives. Uh, Brian Pitchman, who's been on the show quite a few times before, he's with the Evolve Project. He's um, their director of strategic innovation, does a lot of very interesting things with libraries. And he's going to be talking about something he's been working on, um, doing uh, memory care programming at libraries for people with um, cognitive issues, Alzheimer's, dementia, et cetera. And this is something that he's been working on. So we got some ideas for um, doing this kind of programming through your library uh, for these people. So I hope you will uh, join us for that show and any of the other ones we have um, as well. Um, speaking about technology, the last Wednesday of the month is always our pretty sweet tech session. Um, so if you are here because you are a techie type person in computer science, um, Amanda Sweet is our technology innovation librarian show September 25th, she'll be here. Not sure what her topic is gonna be this this month, but um, I'll hope I'll get that from her soon and you'll know what she's talking about. But it's always the last Wednesday of the, last, of the month. So if you're interested in something techie related, um, sign up for her shows and um, you'll see what, she's, um, see what she has to share. And you can find all of her previous ones on, um, in our archives here. She did Making a Magic Butterfly Wand last week, uh, SEO, geocaching, all sorts of things. All right, so any other questions? I think that will be it for today. We're ending right at the top of the hour. Wow, that hardly ever happens. <laughs> Thanks, Krista. Um, we're always up. All right, so thank you so much, Stephen. This is a great session. So happy to have you here. Um, um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Yes, thanks, everybody. Feel free to reach out if you want more to talk more. Please do, yes. Um, and hopefully we'll see you all in a future episode of Encompass Live. Thanks, Bye -bye. everybody.